Four years after the release of Red Dead Redemption 2, I still find myself thinking about it. This game has moved me, affected me in ways that no other piece of entertainment media ever has. I've never been able to find the right words to properly explain this incredible experience I had back in 2018, only that I know that its quality transcends gaming as a medium and is fair to be compared to any of entertainment's great stories. So many things I have to say about this game, its characters and its message, all swirling around in my mind. But if I were to try and explain every detail of what I think makes this game amazing, this video would be very, very long. So instead, I want to break down one aspect of it that I think is its strongest, and that is the characterization and arc of its main protagonist. Obviously, I can't talk about this without completely spoiling the story, so consider this your spoiler warning. With that out of the way, I'd like to begin telling you about the greatest fictional character I've ever seen, Arthur Morgan. I think good first impressions can be key when constructing compelling and empathetic characters, especially in cases like Arthur where we're expected to spend 90 or so hours with him. And it really didn't take long for Arthur to shine. He is a stone cold badass, the brawn to Dutch's brains, but that was a fact made clear in the trailers. It wasn't until the game actually came out that we got to see the main components of what made him so likeable. Straight out of the gate, it's clear he's characterized with a very rich and deep personality, even more so than some actual real living people I've met. He's as impassive and rough around the edges as you'd expect from a man from the 1890s, but he has a sincerity and selflessness to his personality that allows him to remain good natured and approachable. Despite outward appearances, deep down, he is just a big softy. Pleased to meet you. Well, ain't you just a tough as teak mountain man? Oh, you be quiet, Anastasia. Anyone can tell this one is a pussy cat. Exactly, yes, he's a pussy cat. Ain't that so, Arthur? Whatever you say. How much you cost, anyway? Well, ain't that a nice way to talk to a lady? Oh, I didn't know I was talking to a lady. Excuse me. That reminds me, he also possesses a hilariously sharp wit. He is very funny. Anyway, creating a character that is stoic and intimidating with violent impulsions and then using him as a vessel to explore themes of love, family and responsibility is a fascinating decision for the writers to make, and not to mention a difficult task for the actor to pull off. After experiencing Arthur Morgan's story and coming to the conclusion that I'd never seen a character quite like him, it forced me to ask the question. What makes a truly great and compelling character? Aside from an award-winning performance like the one delivered by Roger Clark, I'd argue that good characters have depth, a vibrant personality, a believable, relatable, and perhaps most importantly, undergo some kind of evolution or change throughout the story. That change could be for better, or for worse. But I'm not a good man, Jimmy Brooks. Not usually. You see, I was in Blackwater. I killed people. And maybe I should have killed you. Should I have killed you, Jimmy Brooks? Me? I never saw you. Not, not now, not, not never. I think we have an understanding. Of course we do. Jimmy Brooks. <laughs> I will remember that. I've got a good memory. This is Arthur in the beginning of the story. While kind-hearted as a friend, Arthur is downright terrifying as an adversary, a blunt instrument designed to enact the will of the Vandalin gang, Dutch's most trusted associate and go-to guy for any manner of intimidation and brute-like strength. This is how Arthur sees himself, a bad man who does bad things. Being one of the first people that Dutch Vandalin recruited into the gang 20 years before the beginning of the game, we're left to assume that Arthur has seen himself this way for most, if not all of that time. This is why he doesn't ever bat an eyelid at doing dishonourable deeds. The most obvious example of this being his treatment of Thomas Downs, when Arthur is sent to collect on a loan that Downs made from the gang. You borrowed money from my business partner, Herr Strauss. You owe him, you took the money. He wants it back, what's not to understand? <coughs> Where's our money? I don't have it. Sell your place. We already owe more than it's worth. 
Then sell your wife or your family or something. We ain't your idea of charity. Is that clear? <coughs> Thomas! What are you looking at? Thomas! I said what you looking at, woman. My husband isn't well. If we could just have more... Like I said, we ain't nobody's idea of charity. Get us the money. Mr. Downs' letter dies of his injuries, and Arthur still returns a few weeks later to collect on the loan from the now widowed Mrs. Downs, even throwing in a seemingly needless threat against her son. My husband's not cold in the ground, and you've come back here, Archie. I nearly paid off what was owed. Your husband knew the rules when he took that money. Now, I'm real sorry about the way things turned out, but he had a choice. Ain't my fault about the way the world is. He didn't have a choice. He was good, and he did good. There wasn't no choice in that. And you've as good as killed him yourself, and don't kid yourself. You had a choice. You speak as if killing was something I cared about. You ever wonder about eternity? You should. I hope it's hot and terrible, Mrs. Downs. Otherwise, I'll feel I've been sold a false bill of goods. Now, please, give me that money. <sighs> Either you got a lazy eye or lack of respect. Which is it, boy? I ain't got no lazy eye. No respect for the likes of you. Well, maybe when your mother's finished mourning your father, I'll keep her in black on your behalf. You think on that, boy? He knows his actions ultimately make him a quote-unquote bad man, but he still feels as though whatever he does is justified by his responsibility to provide for the camp. It's a role he feels is necessary for him to play, as there are 23 other gang members, some of them women and children, who are relying on him to do this in order to provide, much like any parent would do for their family. And to Arthur, that's what this gang is, his family. But it is an age-old question of morality. What lengths would you go to to provide for the people that you care about? And I think most people's answer to that question is often further than what the law would allow. And Arthur is a complete representation of that fact. A representation that the ends always justify the means. So for that reason, we never find him objectively unlikable despite him conducting himself this way. Also, having a character like Micah Bell in the story is a helpful juxtaposition to Arthur, because while both are career criminals and ride in the same gang, Micah, in his bones, is a disgusting, perverted, evil man who has no problem brutally killing or tormenting anyone at any time for any reason. Hell, he even enjoys it. But having him in the gang helps highlight how Arthur is not like that at all, doing what he does out of a perceived necessity and takes no pleasure in needless violence. And thank you. There I was, having a dull day only for you, to liven it up by letting me help you shoot up <laughs> half a town. And even in the case of his seemingly needless threat against Archie Downs' life, I can actually kind of see how Arthur rationalise that it would be necessary for him to do that, because this is the rest of their interaction. I'll keep her in black, on your behalf. You think on that, boy? Well, maybe you shall, sir. And maybe other events will transpire. You best stick to them books, because mark my words on this. Vengeance is an idiot's game. Ah, Mrs. Downs, thank you for your punctuality. He's trying to intimidate Archie into standing down, advising him to think of his mother before throwing himself in front of the crosshairs of a man like Arthur. It's a rough way of warning him, sure, but I do believe he's only trying to reduce the risk of needless violence. It's examples like these that make it so that Arthur can say and do evil things without necessarily being an evil character, otherwise known as an anti-hero. I can't really discuss the evolution of Arthur's character throughout the story without discussing the role of his mentor in that evolution. Arthur's relationship to Dutch Vanderlind is an interesting one. Dutch is an enigmatic personality to say the least and absolutely deserving of his own in-depth character analysis. But to Arthur there isn't anything mysterious about the way that he looks up to Dutch as a mentor and as a father figure. The values of absolute unwavering loyalty, trust and responsibility to the gang are ones that Dutch preaches on a very regular basis, and thus these values have become ideals instilled in Arthur so strongly that he'd happily die in the name of them. In retrospect, Arthur's adoption of these beliefs seems less like the result of a father imparting wisdom unto his son, and more like the preachings of a cult leader indoctrinating his most loyal follower. And so as the story unfolds, and the looming threat of the law closing on the game becomes more and more prevalent, the facade of Dutch's warm-hearted, idealistic persona begins to unravel, and we start to see Dutch's true colours. Already, the dogs are on the way! Oh yeah, oh you're right, you are so right! They are good at smelling filth, huh? So filth has got to be disposed of! 
Weakness. That part. It's difficult to say at what point Dutch truly becomes the villain of the story, or at what point Arthur's faith in Dutch's ability to lead diminishes, but I am certain that Arthur never stopped loving and caring for Dutch as the man who basically raised him. Even as Dutch's descent into villainy becomes increasingly obvious, Arthur never turns his back on him no matter how much we want him to. Arthur's indoctrination simply runs too deep, and no matter how despicable Dutch becomes, he simply cannot betray the man who spent the last 20 years being his father. The other wrinkle in all this for Arthur is about justifying his actions as a career criminal. Arthur's entire code of ethics is based on Dutch's preachings, and every crime he's ever committed was done so under the guise of just trying to survive. If all the justifications for Arthur's life of crime were based on the ideals of a man who was, in actuality, just a heartless monster, then Arthur's crimes aren't really justified at all, slowly realising that the ends don't actually justify the means. If Dutch turns out not to be the man that Arthur believed him to be, then Arthur's entire identity gets called into question, raising some seriously existential dilemmas within Arthur. With all that in mind, it's easy to understand why Arthur has such a hard time turning his back on Dutch as easily as we would, and why being introspective about all this is an exceptionally challenging task for Arthur to confront. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here. Breathe. Again. Let me see your tongue. And say ah. Ah. What is it? It's not good news. Well, I guess that. You got tuberculosis. I'm really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. And just like that, fate forces his hand. Arthur is now faced with the fact that he is, in all likelihood, going to die, and that absolutely rocks him to his core. He's never seemed to be scared of death up to this point in his life, but the concept of dying is now a hell of a lot scarier now he actually has time to contemplate it. This causes his perspective to radically shift, as if to open his eyes for the very first time, completely re-evaluating what's important to him, and seemingly for the first time in his life, he really struggles with the morality of his actions, both past and present. He recognises that the clock is now ticking, with every cough reminding him of his looming mortality. And since he sees himself as a hopeless cause, he chooses to dedicate the time he has left to others. He is still with the gang, sure, but he starts acting more charitably, more compassionately. He starts giving his time and money to people in need, absolving debts instead of collecting them, donating to the church in Saint Denis, and refusing cash rewards for helping people. Even going as far as helping the Downs family get back on their feet, protecting Archie Downs from bullies at the Annisburg mine, and giving money to him and his mum to help start over somewhere else. Here, take this. I don't need it no more. I don't want your money. Yeah, I know you don't want it. I don't. You sure as shit need it. Take it. No. I ain't looking for forgiveness. It ain't about that. But don't forgive me. Just take the money and get out of here. Please. I know I ruined your life. I suffer for it every day. Don't let yourself get killed for, for pride. I've seen it kill too many folk. Don't say anything. Don't thank me. Just take the money and pack your bags. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I said don't thank me. Get out of here. Please. I think it was important for us to see this, because Arthur ruining the lives of the Downs family is one of the bad deeds in his life we actually saw him do. So one could argue that it was actually the audience's forgiveness he needed more than the Downs's. As I mentioned, these are things he decides to do due to his circumstances and newfound clarity. But it's also made clear that despite all of his kind actions, he still feels that none of it makes up for a lifetime of wrongdoings, and at least some part of his motivation for doing good deeds is to atone in some way for doing so many bad ones. But it is a good question. 
If you had six months left to live, how can you possibly redeem yourself of 20 years of murder, assault, robbery, extortion, and exploitation? Arthur seems to come to the conclusion that you just can't. And to be completely honest, I actually found myself kind of agreeing with that. Six months is just not enough time, and even if he had more, would it even matter? Is it even possible to redeem that many sins? And so he's changing his ways and he's turning over this new leaf, but he doesn't believe in it. He doesn't believe that it'll change anything. He believes that he is a bad man, and no matter how many nice things he does from here on out, he will still die a bad man, and flatly disagrees with anybody who says otherwise. Brother Dorkins was right about you. You are the most wonderful man. Brother Dorkins is greatly deceived, I'm afraid, but I'm happy to help a little. What I think is brilliant is that we don't learn any of his thoughts through some lengthy expository voiceover because big, eloquent, grandiose speeches isn't really one of Arthur's strengths, it's just not who he is. We know Arthur so well at this point that we just kind of know that this is all going on in his head, through little clues in conversations, his body language, his mannerisms, his newfound generosity, and some entries in his journal, we can gradually piece together that Arthur, deep down, is an extremely confused and troubled man at this point in his life. However, being a prototypical masculine personality, he always presents himself to everyone else like he's fine and that there's nothing going on with him. Cracking a joke and dismissing someone's concerns about him just to move the conversation along is his absolute go-to move. And how are you? Uh, never better. You okay? Peach. I reckon you're gonna be just fine. Are you alright? Can I get you some water? No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. This is not healthy, and it makes him just as sick mentally as he is physically, in my opinion. Whenever we talk about men's mental health, or how some men have an innate inability to express their feelings, this is the example I think of. I often found myself yelling at the screen, begging him to talk to someone, anyone, about what he's going through. Morgan! <coughs> Are you okay? Well... Never better. What are you doing here? Well, I'm on my way down to Mexico. They're finally sending me on a mission. Ah. Brother Dorkins is very jealous. <laughs> <coughs> What's wrong? I'm, uh, uh, I'm dying, sister. Okay. Yeah, I got TB. I got it. Beating a man to death <clears throat> for a few bucks. <sighs> I've lived a bad life, sister. We've all lived bad lives, Mr. Morgan. We all sin. But I know you. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> Forgive me. That's the problem. You don't know you. What do you mean? I don't know, but whenever we happen to meet, you're always helping people and smiling. I had a son. He passed away. I had a girl who loved me. I threw that away. My mama died when I was a kid. And my daddy... Well, I watched him die. I weren't soon enough. My husband died a long time ago. Life is full of pain. But there is also love and beauty. Uh, what am I gonna do now? Be grateful that for the first time, you see your life clearly. <laughs> sure. Perhaps you could help somebody. Help him makes you really happy. <sighs> but I still don't believe in nothing. <laughs> Often neither do I. <laughs> but then I meet someone like you, and everything makes sense. <laughs> You're too smart for me, sister. <sighs> I guess I... I'm afraid. There is nothing to be afraid of, Mr. Morgan. 
take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. All aboard. I shall oh. try. I know you will. I love this scene. It's so satisfying for Arthur to finally just man up and admit it. Just to let it out. And Sister Calderon's heartwarming response is exactly what Arthur needed to hear. Arthur this whole time has been reflecting on his life of 20 years of bad deeds and wondering how many good ones he needs to perform to make up for it all. And as I mentioned earlier with only 6 months left to live, that is an impossible task. However, I believe that Sister Calderon's point is that good and bad deeds throughout a person's life don't get tallied up at the end to determine if a person was good or bad. Arthur's opportunity to become a good man only started when he first saw his life clearly. That being a good or bad person is not an adjective you get to use to describe yourself, but instead it's something that is earned through how you affect the lives of the people around you. And in Sister Calderon's time around Arthur, all she's seen him do is help people and smile. So from her perspective, of course, Arthur is unquestionably the most wonderful man. And finally, she finishes the conversation telling Arthur to take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. I'll get back to that quote a little later, but I'd like to point out that this conversation does contain a really sweet message, and that is that it's never too late to start doing the right thing, no matter how far gone you think you are. And it's a lesson I think is applicable to all aspects of everyday life. It's never too late to start working harder, to love more, be healthier, make a change, be kinder, etc. Anyway, from this point on, Arthur has a renewed sense of conviction and purpose. Him doing good deeds is no longer just about achieving his redemption, but it's about doing the right thing because it's right. One of my favourite moments demonstrating the growth of his character is in his last debt collection mission, in which he is once again tasked with confronting a widow whose husband borrowed money from the gang. However, this time, Arthur with his newfound clarity takes a different approach. We lent Arthur some money, you see, and... So it was you, you son of a bitch. What do you want now? You want my boy's shoes? You want the food out of our bellies, what little there is? You want me to lie down for you? No, no. I... Arthur gave everything to pay your bills. Everything. And now there's some fellas coming to take the house. There ain't nothing left, mister. I uh, just wanted to say the debt canceled and to uh, here, take this. It won't bring your husband back, I know. You need money and I don't. Well, you're a good man. I just wish you'd done it before he worked himself into the grave. I'm sorry, ma'am. I really am. As for that loving act that Arthur promises Sister Calderon that he'd try and perform, it comes quite poetically in the form of John Marston. Arthur recognises that the gang as we know it is about to collapse, and that Dutch at this point has become so volatile that if anyone attempted to run away and escape the outlaw life, it would be interpreted as complete disloyalty and betrayal. In John, Arthur sees a younger version of himself, still with all the opportunities for an honest life with a family that has since passed Arthur by. I feel like you should take your woman and child and get lost. Do you? You can... You could give something to Jack. It's that or... Well, I don't see no way out of this. But what about loyalty? Be loyal to what matters. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I'll be okay, but do it for me. It would make me... Feel good, if that makes any sense. A little, but listen to me. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. Arthur makes it his mission to ensure that if the gang goes down, John and his family will not go down with it, believing that John's family is the one glimmer of positivity that can come out of all of this death and chaos. One more big score, we got enough money to leave. All this turmoil has the army and Pinkerton spinning, we take a boat and slip away. I don't know what you're saying, Dutch, but it seems like I've heard it all before. Just one more and time. And I'm a goddamn train. Arthur! <coughs> this is different. We know this is full of cash. Army payroll. 
money and supplies to repair the bridge that you blew. This is all going to plan. What do you think? It sounds wonderful. Hell, yeah. I ain't got much to lose, but... You know, the women and the children. And John and his family. I'm afraid I have to insist. I mean, we gotta let them go, because if the Pinkertons come through again, they will kill everyone. John? Insist? Yeah. Insist. The final sequence in Arthur's story is a roller coaster to say the least, and I'm not here to recap the story or sit here and just watch cutscenes with you, because I could easily stretch this video to 90 minutes dissecting each one. All I'll say is that every single scene in the last two missions is masterfully directed and performed, and completely serves to send off Arthur's character in the most beautifully heartbreaking way possible. His final scene with Sadie and Abigail, and the subsequent final ride back to camp is featured in countless crying compilations of other people on YouTube because it is undeniably very moving. It forces you to reflect on Arthur's journey of redemption and how far he's come as a character. I myself am pretty good at holding it together in emotional scenes, but even the most stone cold of gamers are going to have a hard time with this one, and it only gets harder as the ending unfolds. Arthur returns to camp to warn Dutch, having uncovered the truth that Micah has been snitching to the law about the gang's movements. It is fascinating to me that even after Dutch has made decisions that's directly resulted in the deaths of other members of the gang, abandoned Abigail and John at various stages in the story multiple times when they needed rescuing, and literally left Arthur to die, Arthur still, despite all that, does not turn his back on Dutch and still feels the need to look out for the man he once called his father. That is fucking loyalty. And it makes this moment... I gave you all I had. Utterly devastating. Alright Arthur, come on, let's go! You go. Keep pushing, Arthur. No. <coughs> no. I think I've pushed all I can. Come on. You go. We ain't got time for this, not now. We ain't both gonna make it. Go. Now. I'll hold them off. It would mean a lot to me. Please. There ain't no more time for talk. Go. Arthur. Go to your family. Arthur! Get the hell out of here and be a goddamn man. You're my brother. I know. I know. I mentioned before that Arthur doesn't do long, impassioned speeches, nor is he terrific at conveying his feelings. But here he doesn't need to. All of that sincerity and emotion comes through in the performance. Arthur saying goodbye in the most Arthur way possible should put a smile on every face who watches it. And at the very end, when he's beaten and bloody, just minutes away from death, he says, I tried. In the end, I did. You sure did, mate. It's a line that always makes me crack a teary smile. It made me realise that he lies there, not as a casualty of Dutch's evil machinations, but as the winner of his own story. He took a gamble that love exists, and he did a loving act. He earned the redemption that he never thought he'd have, and was able to die on his own terms, watching the sunrise one last time. Before I actually sat down to write all this out, I thought I had so much ready to say that it'd be easy for me to write, but when I actually sat down to start, I couldn't write anything. It must have been three days that I stared at a blank word document with no words coming to mind, only feelings I didn't quite know how to articulate. Because that's what this character did to me, what he still does to me four years later, and that is leave me speechless. And because of that effect that this character had on me, Arthur Morgan is, for my money, the greatest fictional character I have ever seen.